Hey, we we just uh, got to have, have the amazing Scott McKnight on the podcast. Yeah, dude, this is such a privilege. Uh, we contacted Scott uh, on a hope that he would he would come on Rethinking God with Tacos, and he said yes. And yeah. immediately, I went into crazy nervous mode because this guy has so impacted uh, my life and our church. He wrote a book, yeah. a church called Tove forming a goodness culture that resists abuse of power and promotes healing. Outstanding book. And I'm going to recommend <laughs> everybody buy this book. Here's another thing I'm going to do. Everybody buy this book and give it to your pastor if you're a part of a church. Wow. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I'm going to say this. I'm going to read what you sent me so that people in the circle of Tove, when we practice the habits of empathy and compassion, extending grace, putting people first, telling the truth, promoting justice and serving others, Tove, which means goodness, the goodness of God, Tove emerges in the culture and we all become more Christ-like. Yeah. Scott and Laura, his daughter, wrote this book and it was in response to yeah, so Scott and Laura wrote this book in response to the abuses by Bill Hybels at Willow Creek. Yeah. And yeah. that were revealed in the Chicago Tribune. And um, uh, Laura was a, a part of that church. They both had been a part of that church. But uh, Scott immediately knew that the women involved were to be believed. And uh, eventually it came out, but uh, he deals with the narcissistic tendencies that pastors have and uh when you read this book <laughs> you're gonna start spotting narcissism all over the place uh but the good news is is there's hope yeah yeah there's hope for a way forward and so that's what this book is all about is ultimately becoming christ-like yeah particularly those that are serving in the church and then scott doesn't necessarily even believe in the leadership culture yeah and we get into that in the podcast here uh he says, we're not called, to, Jesus didn't call to say, hey, come and be a leader. He said, come and be my follower. We need more followership in the church. Yeah, yeah. And what I appreciated about him is that he is he's operating in the context of the love of God of reconciliation. Like he he sees through that lens. He's looking for the redemptive, uh, the redemptive way and loves the church. This is not a knock on the church or a knock on leadership. This is a man and, and his daughter who, who are passionate about us becoming like Jesus, uh, becoming folks that lay our lives down for one another. And I just appreciate that that's the approach he took to such a, a topic that uh, could tend to pull out, you know, people want to pull out the guns and they want to, uh, they want to, they want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, if, if you know what I'm saying. So yeah. I really appreciate his approach. Yeah. And, and Scott definitely, definitely is a believer in, in the church. The one that Jesus wants to build. <laughs> And uh, it's really, I think, a prophetic call to be a church like the one that Jesus is establishing, not a business. Uh, you're not selling a product. Uh, you're not making yeah. a product. Man, you are yeah. helping create disciples and followers of Jesus. And Scott, Scott is no joke, man. This guy is uh, the professor of New Testament at Northern Seminary. Uh, man, he is written books like the has written books like the Jesus Creed, uh, the King Jesus Gospel, the Fellowship of Difference, Blue Parakeet, one of your faves. Yeah. A Kingdom Conspiracy. Uh, he's a blogger. I mean, he is a he's a serious individual. And he took this topic seriously because uh, the word Tov is the Hebrew word for goodness. And we find it right on the first pages of the Bible when God created the earth, the world and called it Tove, he called it good. So, how do we create a goodness culture in our churches? Uh, this is a good podcast. Yeah, it was good to have him on, and good to get back at it with you, man. I'm excited for uh, what we have ahead and uh, and the folks that we have coming on. So, this is a good way to to start kicking it off. Yeah, Jason, good to be back and uh, eating tacos together again. All right, guys, you're gonna love this podcast. We're so glad that you're on the ride with us. Bless you guys. Well, it's good to have you. Welcome. Welcome to the podcast. Yeah, welcome, Scott. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good to be with you. We're excited you're here. Could you share a little bit, first of all, with our audience about who you are, where you're located, and, and what you're doing? I know we want to dive into this book, but if you could just start out by telling yeah. us a little bit about who you are. Uh, Scott McKnight. Uh, I'm a professor of New Testament at Northern Seminary 
I've been there, this is my ninth year. I've been teaching, I think, 38 years as a professor. And um, I'm an author and uh, a speaker, uh, those sorts of things. Uh, been married. My wife and I were, uh, grew up together in a small town west of Chicago, well, 100 miles west of Chicago. And so uh, we often tell people, we don't know anyone the other one doesn't know. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's unusual in this day and age. Yeah. And um, let's see, we have two children. My son, uh, Lucas, is, uh, works for a sports analytics company. He worked, okay. with, he worked with the Chicago Cubs for like 20 years. He played uh, minor league ball for five and then was in the front office for 15. Wow. For the Cubs. Yeah. Yeah. He was a, he played minor league ball for five summers. Wow. And then, uh, but he was, uh, he was the assistant scouting director. Yeah. Awesome. When the Cubs won the world series. So he has a ring just like all the players. Oh, so. very cool. <laughs> And my daughter uh, is a grade school teacher. She teaches right now. She's teaching kindergarten. That's awesome. And uh, she and I, she, uh, I often tell people, she pestered me till we wrote this book. Right. And uh, I kept telling her, I said, Laura, you have no idea what this will mean down the road if this book catches on. I said, I'll have to take care of all the podcasts while you're teaching. So that's what we're doing today. I'll remind her tonight. Well, we're having her on as well, but we're really, really glad. <laughs> oh, to that's have right. You. That's right. I forgot about that. You can tell her that I said she was a pastor. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you said it lovingly. Yeah. That's awesome. Go ahead, Derek. Yeah, Scott. Um, first of all, you know, I want to say thank you and Laura for writing this book. Um, yeah. I've been handing it out to all of my pastor friends. Thank you. Uh, whether they want it or not, they're getting a copy. And um, I really, I really see this book as a prophetic call, you know, back to Jesus's vision for the church, uh, the one that he said he will uh, build, that the gates of hell will not prevail against. And I kind of believe our, our listeners today will really connect with um, the circle of Tove that you outline in the book mm -hmm. uh, as a means of correcting this toxic culture that we see in many churches. So first of all, thank you for writing it. Yeah. But um, I guess to to jump right in, uh, I have absolutely devoured this book. And I, I think I appreciate most that you don't pull any punches uh, in the way that you deal with the Willow Creek situation, which was kind of the catalyst for you and Laura to write this book. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, but at the same time, it's not a salacious, you know, yeah. look at all the the toxicity. It's it's really a path forward. One of the things that I noticed is in the book, you mentioned that Laura initially was a little reluctant to believe what was happening and that it was truly that way. Whereas it seems like you kind of, you know, when the Chicago Tribune report came out, you kind of knew right away that, okay, there's something wrong here. Is that just from experience? What, what in you knew that the women were pe to be believed and that this was a, a legitimate, uh, you know, tragic situation? Well, you are right. Uh, uh, Laura was hesitant to believe it. It was really the first time she'd ever confronted, experienced anything like that. Whereas, you know, I've been involved, I've been involved with this since I was 17 years old and I'm 67, 68. Um, so, um, in fact, the, my pastor, when I was in high school, was, was accused of sexual misappropriate, misbehavior. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I, I was aware of this, but when, when I read the story, see, I, I had the advantage of sitting on the back porch, reading through this article, seeing these names pop up of who were making allegations, Nancy Ortberg, Vonda Dyer. Um, and I thought, I thought there is absolutely no way that these women are going to lie about this story. Right. And because I'd had experience, um, you know, if it's one, if it's one-on-one, -on -one, let's face it, 
that's a very difficult situation. You, you, you could have someone making up allegations. Um, but when it is two people, all of a sudden it's infinitely more credible. And when you have three or four, uh, then uh, it's true. Yeah. So I wrote to um, I wrote to Nancy Beach right away, and I said I believe you. Wow. Um, and and I I just thought this this happened, and so I told Laura that night. I said what really matters in this situation for the sake of Willow Creek is how they respond to these allegations. Because I've seen enough of these over the years to say, if they come out and pound the women, it's going to get worse rather than better. But eventually, the truth is going to be known, and the perpetrating pastors are going to be exposed for the behaviors that they 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 did, even if they don't admit them. Right. They'll eventually they'll be tried in a public court of people who say. I don't believe that man. I believe the women. So that that's what happened with me is it wasn't so much a, a delay with Laura uh, because all that we could have expected of her was to, to process it. And she and her husband had had so much experience at Willow Creek. We'd gone for 10 years and I never saw anything or suspected anything. Um, and so but but the minute I saw those women, Nancy Ortberg, Nancy Beach, and Vonda Dyer, and I knew I knew Nancy, I know Nancy Ortberg and Nancy Beach, and I don't believe there's any way under the sun that either one of them would not tell the truth. Plus, I'm more of a feminist on some of these topics. Yeah, I'm inclined to believe the women. That's right. The marginalized, the victims, the powerless. Yeah, I'm inclined to give them credence yeah. um, if at all possible. So yeah. I started there and it made total sense to me. Yeah. Well, um, I love that you go ahead, Jason. Um, I know that the first place that you started was you start with the marginalized, you start with the victim and, and because they don't have a platform, I know you've spoke to that and the fact that um, there is such a, a large mechanism in place for the leadership of a church yeah, yeah, that's so true. Um, and so your your first thing to do is how do you step in and protect? Yeah, I love that you called her. I I mean that's such a relational approach on your end, and and something that I so appreciated. Uh, I've I've gotten to know you more. I actually had finally put together that you wrote the Blue Parakeet, which I just put that together. Uh, I have I was like, oh my gosh, I get to talk to that guy. <laughs> <laughs> but I I I've just dove in uh, to the Book of Tov. Yeah, I'm a little bit fresh, but I love the reconciling way in which you've approached it uh, as you begin to unpack how these things could happen and how these things could remain hidden in a church and who to speak to first. And and I, I love that it, that everything you're doing is through a restorative lens. Uh, and I would I appreciate hearing that you called because that's such a relational. I can imagine what that would do for her uh, with everything that was piling on and, and the machine that was getting into gear. Uh, to suggest otherwise, I um, I maybe misspoke. I I contacted her via an email. Okay. I mean, Nancy and I do talk at times. Okay. I just talked to her last week or two weeks ago, but um, I contacted her and I contacted yeah. Nancy Ortberg. I didn't know Vonda Dyer, but when I did get to know her, I contacted her and and other women in the stories. I've talked to almost every one of them at Willow Creek. Yeah. And. Uh, I've told him I believe him. Yeah. But it's it is yeah. so hard when you are powerless and marginalized to find people in the establishment mm. who will believe you. You know what these women, several of these women sit, talk to me about, why have none of the pastors in the United States come forward and stood up for us? Yeah, it's heartbreaking. I mean, they were asking this question. Where's Where's Rick Warren? Yeah. Where's Craig Groeschel? Where's yeah. Andy Stanley? Why Why aren't they standing up for us? Now, you know, uh, both of you are pastors, is that right? I have been. Derek is currently. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, one of the things pastors do if they want to be successful is they keep their mouth shut and they keep their nose out of other people's business. <laughs> is that right? Yeah. 
I mean, you don't survive very long if you want to be um, an opinion writer on every issue that arises. I mean, you're going to get. That's why I'm not a pastor anymore. Either that or you'll get. We'll end up with a church of people who are just like you. Right. Um, but, um, and I, I tried to explain that, but there was another part of that story that I thought they should have said something. They, there's too many of them. And I'm not blaming Rick Warren or Andy Stanley. What I'm saying is they needed people in the establishment to stand up for them in order to move that story forward at the pace that it should have gone, and they didn't. Yeah. Now there were a lot of there were a lot of people on Twitter who supported them. Sure. And uh, that's if if you've got social media like Twitter against you, you're in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> because today it's 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 a very serious pile on situation. So, well, thanks for that question. Yeah. Well, Scott, uh, l- you know, let me say that um, I totally understand what you're saying. Um, I also get into a lot of trouble on Twitter myself. Uh, But let me also say, uh, I think you're in great company uh, declaring yourself a feminist, as I believe Jesus was probably the greatest feminist uh, the earth has ever known. Uh, Number one, by commissioning a woman to preach his resurrection to um, his cowering disciples up in the upper room. (laughs) Uh, a lot of people miss that one, mm-hmm. but uh, I guess what I appreciate so much about Tobin, first of all, I think we need to kind of take just a step back and realize that the word Tov is the Hebrew word for goodness. And would you just speak a little bit about the word Tov? And then I want to, I want to ask you, why are you hopeful about the future of the church? Uh, Tov um, is is found in everybody's Bible on page one, over and over and over. Everything that God created is tov. And, and the basic theological picture of this word tov, good, in the Old Testament especially, is that God is good, tov. Everything God does is tov. Everything God creates is tov, including human beings who are called to be tov. And they're in being called to to be tov and to do tov, they're called to run from ra, which is the Hebrew word for evil or even injustice. So they're called to be tov, and then Jesus comes along, and um, he he tells his disciples that they uh, are to do tov works. Yeah, and Paul says the fruit of the spirit is tov or goodness. He would have used the word tov frequently when speaking Aramaic and Hebrew. But one of the more fascinating ones is that we preach the good news, and it is a combination of the word el and angelos. And the first one means good. (laughs) And el is a frequent translation of the Hebrew word tov. So, So the gospel is a tov message. It's the message about Tov. Uh, and that, you know, is such an important thing. And here's the other important thing. We had a dickens of a time convincing our publisher to use the word Tov in the title. And I said, you know, they weren't going to do it. They said, no, we don't use Hebrew. I said, just I said, just use it a little bit in your office and see what happens. Right. And the next thing is they liked it. I said, everybody, when I use it in class, Everybody's using the word tov, and they use it for everything. Even when it doesn't work, they use it. So so it's a beautiful little Hebrew word yeah. that carries a huge punch, and it's a freshness, isn't it? Um, it's fresher than the word good, yep. and it doesn't have the baggage of Protestant Reformation that is very nervous about the word being good. So uh, we've, had a, we've had a tov time with this little <laughs> word. Well, I, I mean, I'm personally so glad that you stuck with it and asked your publisher to stick with it because, I mean, people in our church now are using the word <laughs> tov just interchangeably with the word good. I mean, after church. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, you know, I'll get like, oh, Pastor D, that message was so tov. Yeah. Way to go. Yeah. You know, and we're interjecting it in our daily language now. But um, I think I think the most brilliant thing about this book is the pathway you've laid out, which you call the circle of Tove. And I want to I just read it for our listeners, but then I'd love for you to summarize it 
I, I think everybody should go buy this book uh, as soon as possible and hand it to their pastor and read it themselves and see if their church is indeed a Tove church. But the first step is to nurture empathy and resist a narcissist culture. Then to nurture grace and resist a fear culture. To put people first and resist institutionalization. To tell the truth and resist false narratives. To nurture justice and resist a loyalty culture. To nurture service and resist a celebrity culture. And then finally, to nurture Christ-likeness and resist the leader culture. Can you just summarize how you encapsulated that and brought this into the book? Where did that all come from? Well, um, we had um, a load, uh, a basket full of crap, if I can say it. We had all these stories of toxicity. Yeah. And they're so easy to find. Yep. Um, right now, they're being, they're all over the place. and. I told Laura when she was interested in in me writing, uh, and I had already turned down a publisher to write a book about Willow Creek because I didn't want to write about. I'm not a church historian. I can't. I can't put that stuff together in some context like that. So, so um, I was working on another project and reading another book, and suddenly I had some categories. I thought, well, this is fresh, and this can help with the Willow story and the Southern Baptist stories. Those were the two that were really rocking in my head. The the local one with James McDonald and uh, Harvest Chapel, that was there, but I wasn't as interested in that story. But um, what we noticed is these characteristics. So Derek, you asked where it came from. The characteristics of toxicity. We, we mapped these and we said, these are and I would tell Laura that these are the characteristics, and eventually we landed on seven of these that I thought were characteristic of these toxic churches. And I said, I said we could go to the fruit of the spirit, or we could go to the beatitudes, the way uh, many people read them. Sure. And we could say, now this this is what we should be developing, rather than these toxic things. And I said, no, yeah. let's flip the toxicity. And find what's the opposite of that. And so the opposite of a narcissist yep. who has utterly no insight into his own character and um, who is totally self-satisfied and concerned about himself um, is empathy, yeah. is the capacity to empathize with others. And the flip side of a power through fear culture is grace. The person who can offer someone who has done something wrong, uh, grace. A third is, is institutions, we noticed this is constant, is that there was a desire to protect the institution. Many of the victims of pastors are afraid to come forward because of what it will do to the church, but also because of the blowback that comes at the systemic level from an institution, yeah. which is very powerful. Yeah, it is. And so we said the opposite of that is peop you put people first rather than institution. Yeah. And that's huge. And then we noticed all these toxic churches spun the narrative. They wanted to tell the story their way. So, no, that's not really what happened. This is the way it looked. Now I look pretty good, and we win, and the church is not that bad. Now that victim is actually the one who's the accuser, and they darvo, it's called darvo, is to flip the script. We flipped it at to say that, no, we tell the truth. Um, a Tove culture tells the truth. And we noticed loyalty is... You follow us first, and we, I, I'm big on the Hebrew word tzedek. Uh, I, t I teach New Testament studies. We talk about justification all the time. So these terms are all important. Justice in the Bible is not measured by the U.S. Constitution or by freedom or by duties and rights. It is to do the right thing at the right time as measured by Jesus and the revelation of God in Christ. Yeah. That's what's right. And a Tove culture does justice in that sense. And we notice there's a celebrity culture. This is huge. <laughs> These people who are toxic frequently have a lot of power 
and have a lot of charisma. You tie charisma to power, the capacity to, fra- uh, to f- make other people afraid into a narcissistic personality, and you end up with a celebrity who's getting all the glory. And, um, and we said, no, um, in a Tove culture, we serve. Yeah. This is the opposite yeah. of what Jesus teaches. Yeah. And then the last one, I have a bug in my, I have a bone in my throat. <laughs> uh, I, I grew up fishing and my dad taught us how to take care of bones in fish. But um, I get worried about a leadership culture where we're focusing on leadership that derives from the business world rather than followership that derives from the Bible. Yeah. And so we posed, we noticed that these were all leadership cultures and we posed Christ likeness over against that. But yeah. actually yeah. Christ likeness puts it all together. That's right. Plus I got to quote Eugene Peterson, <laughs> who's griped about leadership for how long <laughs> did he, he did it for 40 years. He complained about leadership culture. And your love is revival. Crown. Hey guys, I'm interrupting this podcast for just a minute so I can invite you to partner with us by giving to a family story. A family story is a 501, a nonprofit, and it's our ministry. And it's what allows for me to produce this podcast and other regular content. We've been living this faith journey for a long time, but 2014 was when we officially stepped away from the traditional pastoring approach to full-time ministry. It's been fun. This journey has been wild. And this last year was no less faith-inducing with COVID affecting travel and speaking. And it's been good because, hey, we started a podcast. Our passion is to create content catalytic for an encounter with the always good, transforming, reconciling love of our Heavenly Father. And so our heart through this ministry has always been that through speaking, writing, film, and music, we're relentlessly sharing the goodness of our Father, the good news. Your giving goes directly to support this podcast, as well as written content, discipleship content, teaching small group messages, articles that we release weekly, and also the book I'm writing. I'm excited about what I'm chasing down right now. We appreciate all the support, whether it's sharing, writing a review, following us, signing up for our email list, or financially. We just love being on the journey with you. If you want to give to A Family Story, you can go to afamilystory.org, afamilystory.org, and click on the Give button. All right, thanks, guys. Let's get back to the podcast. I'm with you on that. I've got the same bone in my throat. Is that the right saying? Yeah, you can say that. Bug in, yeah, yeah. Bug in the bonnet and a bone in the throat, I guess. Bug in the bonnet and bone in the throat. Uh, I love what you're saying. I think most, and anybody who's listened to our podcast knows, the most transformative thing that, that has existed in my life is, is a phrase that hit me 15 years ago that was obvious. It was Jesus' perfect theology. Yeah. Uh, Jesus is what God is like, yeah. and he came to show us the Father and what it looks like to live confident as his son, went to a cross and reconciled the whole world to himself. And as I've, as I've become more and more convinced, and that talk about goodness, uh, that God is good, that his, that his love is always good, looks like Jesus. Uh, the further down the road I go, the more I'm convinced that what we believe about God, what we believe about his nature determines what we believe about ourselves and what we believe about everyone around us and what we believe about leadership and relationship and on and on and on. Uh, and if Jesus, uh, if, if Christ isn't reconciling the world to himself, if Christ is in fact, um, uh, this is where it gets a little bit theological, but I know you're, you're way farther down a road than I am and can certainly can speak to this well beyond myself uh, from, from an academic standpoint as well, but I know you could speak about the nature of reconciliation. My question is this, is why do we have these leadership? Where did they come from? And I would, I would hazard to say, or at least some of my thoughts are, is that some of what we've believed about the goodness of God has been incredibly flawed. And, and when you have that kind of thing that is stewarded in the church, um, it creates all of these broken dynamics. It creates room for things to become hidden, for things to be held back, for people to be abused, if you will, uh, and people to look away. And 
what is it about what we believe about the nature of God that has has led us to some of these broken things within the church? You know, um, I get a little nervous about the idea, and I don't think you've said this, but um, I get a little nervous about the idea. If we have the right thought about God, we will practice the right things. Okay. Because I know some real dipsticks who believe the right things about God, but who are character, whose character is quite flawed. So I'm searching for a way that our theology isn't so rigid like this. Now, I, I do believe that, that we have f- fundamentally flawed ideas about God. Right. All right. Um, and I believe that flawed ideas about God, for instance, there is a correlation between authoritarian pastors and a view of God that's authoritarian. Okay, now I would like to say that it is because they are authoritarian personalities that they find the authoritarian themes about God and exploit them. Right. That's good. In other words, I don't know that it is a view of God that leads to their authoritarianism as it is a personality that seeks legitimation in a divine reality that they have confused. Okay. So I think one of the most important things we can do is surround ourselves with time with Jesus in the Gospels yeah, and surround our si- ourselves with people who are tov. We will learn about God in spending time with Jesus more than we will ever learn about God reading a systematic theology, part one, theology proper. Uh, And we will learn more about God when we surround ourselves with people who are gracious and kind and loving and just and peacemaking than we will reading a systematic theology. Now, you know, I'm a professor. I write books. Right. So I'm 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 saying something about my discipline that lived theology is more potent than written theology. Wow. I believe that. I agree. That's beautiful. So, if you hung out with Mr. Rogers yeah. for 15 years and worked with him, you would have experienced the divine reality more than probably attending sermons on those 15 years of Sundays. Ooh, I love that. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Well, and, okay. and Scott, you, uh, you bring up Mr. Rogers in your book. There's a, a beautiful section uh, about his daily effort to imagine the people he would interact with and imagine showing Tove to them showing grace to them, showing kindness to them Mm -hmm. before he ever met them. So the people he knew he was going to encounter that day, he would use his creative imagination to come up with a a tove or good way of interacting with them and blessing them and and serving them. And uh, it's people, if they buy the book only for the Mr. Rogers section, man, it's money well spent. Right. But back to it was originally three times longer than it is now, though. <laughs> it was too long. It was too long. Those editors. So good. I mean, I literally read it verbatim in the church. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. So um, you guys both mentioned some things about uh, bones in your throat. And, in you know, I, I come from Texas uh, for a while. And so back there, we called it a burr in my saddle. <laughs> um, I also have a huge burr in my saddle about the leadership culture. And when I was in ministry, we went through every leadership book known to man, including Bill Hybels, John Maxwell, uh, of course, all the Christian uh, leadership books. But then you also had your Jack Welch's and your, you know, mean business that got incorporated in the, into the church. And it, it really began to bother me because, and in your book, you say this, Jesus never said to anyone, come become a leader. He said, come follow me. Jesus wants followers, not leaders. And when you start dismantling the leadership culture in the church, you are definitely poking the bear. 
because it is pervasive. And so, um, what you know, one one thing I think that leaders and the leaders that I've been involved in and, and around is they demand loyalty. And in your book, uh, you and Laura both make this comment that loyalty is not a fruit of the spirit. W- would you speak a little bit into that? reason why people are looking to be loyal to a leader hmm. other other than Jesus. Uh, loyalty in, in, a, in a church culture by, uh, let's just say, a leader rather than a pastor. Pastors don't demand loyalty. That's so good. Pastors ask people to follow Jesus with them. Um, um, loyalty creates security. It creates safety. It creates a lack of threat. It creates uh, sameness, conformity. And um, for some reason, um, there is a sense in which we want to be faithful to God, to his son, Jesus Christ, through the power of the Spirit, to what God is doing in the world in our church. Okay, if we have all those, those preconditions clarified first— Loyalty will no longer sound like loyalty to a pastor. It will sound like we are doing what God has called us to do in this this community. And all of a sudden, it gets a little bit bigger and broader and better. But loyalty is one that is a characteristic of a narcissistic, power-mongering leader who wants conformity so everything that happens is consistent with his and almost always a male, yeah. his vision or his ideas. And then because, I mean, both of you have experienced this at some level. I know I have. Um, when you are called to be a pastor in a church, when you are preaching the Bible, you're talking for God to the people. And the people who are blessed by that, let's just use the word bless as a, as a really great term. Are feel like you have mediated God to them. Right. All of a sudden now you are on a pedestal. Yeah. As a in a priestly sense, and 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 a lot of it's good. I mean, I'm not saying it's bad. In a priestly sense, you're mediating God, and all of a sudden now you have power. You have huge respect beyond what you should have, and when then you demand loyalty. These people are going to experience it as, if I want to be obedient to God, I have to be loyal to this man. Yeah. And now we got big problems. Mm-hmm. So that's, I don't know if that, uh, Derek, if that's quite answering your question, but that's that's where I was headed. Yeah, no, no, thank you so much for that. I uh, um, really had a, had a difficult time relaying that into the culture of even our congregation, because like I said, the leadership culture is so pervasive in the church Mm -hmm. and um but the simplicity is is jesus is looking for followers and you said something earlier that reminded me of of a statement that i say probably every podcast and that is that i love the word of god and i like my bible too (laughs) and it's exalting jesus to that place of the absolute expression of the father Mm -hmm. and uh as opposed to maybe exalting you know this written text above uh who jesus is and what he's all about um not to diminish the bible in any way shape or form i believe it's authoritative i believe it's inspired but at the same time um jesus is the one to be worshiped and it's another thing you do really really well in this book you come back to Christ likeness is formed through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not just a formula that we try to enact. In fact, the circle of Tove is um, fueled and powered by the uh, presence of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, I, I just wanted to throw that in there about how much I appreciate, I appreciate. that 100% reliance on Jesus, on the Holy Spirit. Um, in creating a Tove culture. And, you know, when you mentioned pastors being so susceptible to narcissism, is that the case or is it that the narcissists are drawn to the pastorate, pastoral work because of the, the position it puts them? I mean, maybe it's both and, but uh, 
how do we help create this environment to give people permission to leave these cultures? Because they're probably not going to change them from the inside out. Well, you've said about 50 things there that are all, all worth talking about. I, mean, <laughs> the, uh, I, I do want to say that uh, I think your, your point uh, about narcissism and the pastorate, which, which comes first, you know, the chicken or the egg. And I'm inclined to think that um, there's a lot of people pastoring who are narcissists and they are religious narcissists. Christian narcissists, yeah. and they they want to find the place where they can maximize their glory. So um, the pastorate attracts narcissists. Okay, I'm with that. Now, we uh, Laura and I are writing another book right now. Um, it's it's a it's a mess now. It was in pretty good shape. Now it's a real mess, but it, we're going to reorganize it. Um, it's, it's on how to transform a church culture from toxic to tove. Love that. And, um, some things that you've brought up, I, I want to just mention one thing is we have to focus on character rather than performance and skills that get platformed. Um, I don't, I don't think, uh, one of the first characteristics the Apostle Paul looked for in co-workers and in people who would become the elders in local churches was how good of a speaker they were in front of people. Sure. When you when you're in a in your living room with eight other people and that's your church, your capacity to preach is zero. And your character is what's going to carry the day. So character is very important. And uh, the use of power is very important. So, um, but at the same time, um, we have to give people categories. And I think this is what the Tove book has done, is we've given people analytics for discerning toxicity in their church or institution. I got a letter today. Chris and I were walking around our lake, which we do every day twice. Um, and we saw some shovelers on the lake, northern shovelers, which is a nice duck. So it was a, it was a well, it was a good walk. <laughs> I got a, I got a text message from a friend at a well-known Christian college who said, do you realize that everything in your Tove book describes our school. He said, it is toxicity to the core. Every element of toxicity is there. Well, in a sense, I think Laura and I are eventually going to get blamed for, for unmasking toxicities in churches, and so pastors are not going to be happy with us. So what I would say, Derek, is is I think we've given some people some analytics. Now, how to move those analytics into the public consciousness of that local church is a very delicate thing that, if done well, can lead to some healing and some transformation. And that's what we've written about. But, you know, let's just say you're a, a, a mother or a father, a husband and a wife in a church and you're just ordinary people uh, with unusual skills of discernment, and you have experienced in the last decade so much of this that you realize this church is toxic. What can you do? I would say what a pastor told me not too long ago, he's a Tove pastor with a Tove church. He said, tell them to leave because as individual people, they can't do anything about it if yeah. they are not in the circles of power. Yeah. So we talk about power, but we also talk about developing some realistic strategies for how to go forward in churches when you recognize toxicity. So Derek, this is the biggest question that Laura and I get asked is what can we do in our church to make it more Tove? And we want to be a part of this process. 
Northern is working on this. Uh, we're going to develop, I think, a Tove culture, Tove center. And um, I want to continue to writing in this, but this isn't what I planned on doing, man. <laughs> I got I got book contracts lined up. <laughs> well, I'm glad you are. We're grateful that you are. Well, thanks. I uh, I'm a writer myself, so that's that's my day job. So I I love hearing other writers talk about how they had a book and then they uh, got all messed up. That's a yeah. That's every other week for me. Yes, yes, uh, yes. But um, I I was going to ask you, and I appreciate you speaking to that. We don't have you a whole lot longer, but I appreciate you speaking to that. I. I I'm 47, grew up in the church and, and, uh, toxic, uh, toxic cultures existed in the eighties too. Yes. (laughs) And, uh, and so, you know, we, we've seen that loyalty thing and, and been the one voice in the room and ended up on the other side. Mm. You know, I told you before we hit record, I lived in Ontario, but I, I did my high school years in Vancouver. The reason we did that is because the church kicked us out essentially. Mm. Uh, and, and literally family members, uh, disassociated from us and, Mm. and, uh, very, very painful for my folks. I was a young, young fella. Uh, but it certainly impacted my upbringing and would say that those wounds became scars over the years. And we ended up being six years later when the thing collapsed on itself, which, which eventually things get exposed and they, and it collapsed. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, we ended up being the voice we'd gone through healing and ended up being the voice people could reach out to and, and help them walk through that. Good for you. But so many, so many left the faith even. Yep. Uh, over that sort of a thing. And so I, I'm so grateful that you're working on this, this new book, because I think, I think that was going to be my question uh, for those who are voiceless, who find themselves having experienced uh, uh, some form of abuse. Uh, Spiritual abuse can be the most, Mm -hmm. the most painful. Mm -hmm. Um, I appreciate that you're, you're, you're chasing this down and you've taken a left turn or, or being faithful with it because I think there's so, so, so many, mm-hmm. uh, that are, are actually walking that road right now and feel helpless, feel completely marginalized. So, man, I'm so appreciative that you're doing that. Uh, is there anything that you could say? Cause I, I, this is where I find myself. I, I stepped away from pastoring about seven years ago to do writing full time. And, um, I found that my conviction in the goodness of God was too good for some folks and uh, cause for uh, offense. But what it ended up leading me into is suddenly I'm meeting with a whole lot of marginalized people. I get invites to, to visit home churches and, mm-hmm. and there's a whole, so I'm aware of this whole group of people that aren't within the Sunday morning context, but are the church mm-hmm. uh, that are listening to this podcast right now and are thankful for what you're pushing at. And, and probably some of the, the attacks you've taken, but what is it that you could share with them for, yeah. for just an encouragement of today? Well, the, I, I, Laura and I invented this expression. I always take credit for it. And then she always takes credit for it. So we'll find out who actually said it <laughs> in, in history. At the final judgment, I will ask who invented this expression. <laughs> um, but we believe in forming pockets of Tove. Yeah. So what you've got in a lot of these house churches are pockets of Tove. Yeah. And some of them are so separated from a, a, the, a, the institutional type church that yeah. they're a church themselves rather than a, a pocket within a church. But I- if you stay within a church, find people who are like-minded with you about yeah. Tove. That's good. Stick with them, glue yourself to them and work with them and find Tove as a redemptive healing place within the church. And then see if you can get that little group to grow a bit, develop realistic expectations. And and I think the the best expectation for many people who are powerless is just to be heard, is to be given a voice at some point to where they think they at least heard me in that elder board. And I think they see that it could be an issue and it may never go any further beyond that. But at least you get heard. Then develop realistic time ex- expectations. How long can I live like this in this church hmm. before I can no longer take it and say, I'm, gonna, I'm willing to work at this for a year or maybe two. And if I don't see significant change and this is what I think it should look like and sort of map out what you think has to happen first then it's time to move on. And uh, 
find redemptive healing in a church that is shaped toward Tov, no matter what the name on the front of the church is. Amen. It's good. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, so Scott, I, I heard a little hint there that there may be a Tov center in the future. Uh, I think Chicago is just way too cold for that. And I would like to invite the Tove Center to be established in the beautiful city of Charlotte, North Carolina. Jason and I will be your biggest fundraisers and uh, let's make it happen. Hey, I'm sitting on my back deck right now. That's how nice it is here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, uh, Scott, we, we sincerely thank you for uh, being a part of our podcast today and for you and Laura writing this book, Tove. Um, it is an absolute game changer. Well, thank you. And we're thankful for that. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me on. I'm honored. And well, it was a good conversation. And I'll tell her about it. Good. And we look forward to having Laura on, too. We'll let her know. What, what was the phrase you used for her? She pest. She, she was a pest. She was a pest. <laughs> she was a pest. And uh, tell awesome. her that I invented wounded healers. See what she said. <laughs> We'll do that. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. Can you can you just uh, tell folks where they can find you and and uh, if they want to uh, follow you in any way? Oh uh, yeah, I'm on um, Twitter, Scott McKnight with one T in in Scott, and on Facebook. Uh, you know, I'm on the standard social media. Yeah, I don't right. do Instagram, but uh, I have a Substack newsletter called Tove Unleashed, et cetera. So. Good, good. Scott, I uh, I uh, read your re most recent newsletter and um, uh, retweeted it with uh, Karen Deme or Kristen DeMay. And um, I actually may have gotten myself into a little Twitter trouble here, um, but uh, I have your article to back me up about telling the good, the bad, and the ugly of evangelical culture and history. Uh, but before <laughs> we say goodbye, we got to hear about your favorite taco story. Uh, everybody we believe in the, on the planet has some form of favorite taco. What is Scott McKnight's <laughs> favorite right. taco? Okay. All right. All right. In, in about 19, let's see, 53, 62 or 63, <laughs> my mother introduced our family to tacos. Oh, glory. When no one sold tacos in stores <laughs> and she made her own taco shells nice. and deep fat fried them and we made you know everything was cooked privately and uh, we loved it these things you bite into them and they crack in 40 different directions it's like a stale a round communion uh, piece of bread you know that's awesome <laughs> and uh, but but my mom made her own taco shells and we had tacos we'd do that about once a year and we couldn't wait for it perfect so. perfect okay we will end it on that note man thank you so much for coming on the podcast with us thank you right. yes bless you hey guys thanks for listening we we love doing this podcast uh if you're looking to find us Derek, yeah you can find uh our church at rivercharlotte.com uh, me personally, I'm on Twitter, Instagram, all the places at, at PastorDerekT.com. And it's good. It's really good. He's a Twitter savant. You really got to follow him. Uh, I do Twitter as well. I'm not as good at it, but my handle is uh, at Jason Clark is. Uh, you can find us uh, at a familystory.org. That's uh, the name of our ministry. And uh, if you sign up for the mailing list, you'll get weekly emails with articles, weekly articles and the podcast information. So you can find the podcast on Apple, yep. iTunes, Spotify, all the places you can get podcasts. Type in Rethinking God with Tacos and we'll be there. That's exactly right. And also uh, like, share, retweet and uh, and man, if you could write a review, it actually does something for the rankings. It, it, it makes does, it more yeah. available. So. But a five star review, of course. <laughs> yes. You know, if you can't write a five star review or something, <laughs> Like just don't even write don't, a review. Don't worry. Don't worry about it. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like if you can't say something nice, don't say anything, don't say at, anything all. at all. I, I like that, and then apply that to this <laughs> podcast. Definitely, that's my motto. That's I like what I do. <laughs> so, love you guys. Appreciate you coming on the ride with us. God bless. <laughs>